Breaking the Silence, next on Chronicle. You can see what's important to Jackie Riley on her Facebook page. Family, home, Cape Cod summer days. She's like a daughter to me. I've known this Walpole High grad most of her life. Now she wraps herself in Syracuse Orange. She started sophomore year in August. I was so ready to come back to school. I was so excited to be a peer advisor. I was excited to start my new classes, to be in my sorority. And when her sorority sisters reunited, they were celebrating. We had no homework yet, so we went out. On Fraternity Row, which had come alive. But for Jackie, the celebration was about to end. She bumped into a Massachusetts boy who'd been messaging her online. That night it happened was the first time I'd met him in person. And we had been drinking before. Um, I was a little drunk. Well, I was, I was drunk, but not super out of control of myself. It was 1 a.m. That much Jackie remembers. I don't remember if other people were drinking or taking shots with me. He gave me more alcohol. And the last thing I remember is the bottom of a shot cup and a styrofoam cup. Did that styrofoam conceal a drug? It's a question that will forever haunt her. Something knocked her out. You blacked out. Mm hmm And I have never blacked out like that, ever. She knows at some point she fell downstairs. Then it goes black again. Nine hours of unconsciousness ticked by. I woke up feeling disoriented. I can't prove that there I had been drugged or any of that. However, I do feel like I was because that there, there was something more than alcohol that was affecting my body the next morning. I felt really funny. And terribly scared. She was naked and she was neither home nor alone. He was fully clothed, just staring at me, um, hovering over me. And I looked at him first because he was staring at me, and then I looked around the room and realized where I was. Can you say what happened to you? I was raped. Raped by someone she knew. Most sexual assaults happen by people we know, and I think that's a myth buster still for many people. On college campuses, sexual assault's a major issue, and it usually isn't a stranger lurking in the bushes. I think many parents fear, oh, what if they have to walk alone at night? But it often is an acquaintance or a friend, someone that a victim thought they could trust. Anyone who works with young people on college campuses, young women, knows that rape is beyond epidemic proportion and that often colleges tend to keep it quiet, they bury it. The truth is, study after stunning study reveals 25% of young women, one in four, will be sexually assaulted before graduating. It's everywhere. It's in small colleges in the Midwest. It's in uh, huge Ivy Leagues on the East Coast. And I know this because I travel across the country giving lectures, and I hear the same stories no matter where I am. What's unusual, experts say, is to see young women like Jackie break their silence. Most feel ashamed, even partly responsible, when alcohol was involved. Because I didn't consent, that itself is rape. And I have to keep reminding myself of that. Just because alcohol was involved and just because I don't remember it doesn't mean, like, it didn't happen. And I woke up the next day with physical proof of his violence. I had hickeys down my neck on both sides and fingerprint bruisings on the front and back of my neck. And that doesn't just happen. That, I didn't ask for that. I don't believe someone who's drinking is ever responsible for the choice someone else makes to violate them. I was vulnerable because I had been drinking, but it was not a result and not like I didn't deserve it because I was drinking. Her anguish palpable. Imagine all the girls who bottle up this pain, like Jackie's best friend Caroline, who kept her sexual assault secret for years. The biggest part is that nothing is done and nothing is said. It's just insane how quiet it is. 
together. They're determined to be heard. Particularly with young people, we'll hear um, that they're worried about telling their parents. So that's really their primary concern. My parents will find out and somehow I'll be in trouble. Yeah, I think this call was probably the toughest call to get. It was, it just burst all reality. Mom was the first person Jackie called. The whole ride home, only two days earlier, was this is going to be a great year for Jackie. And then that call, and everything changed. I'm really glad I called her because I definitely would not have gone to the hospital. I would not have gone to seek help. I would have sat in my bed for this entire semester if I didn't call her. With the university's help, Jackie's gotten critical counseling and filed a no-contact letter to keep her attacker away. But chance encounters on campus happen often. At first, the days following, I, my body went into straight panic. Jackie hasn't pressed charges, although that's an option. The emotional stress of a court case would probably destroy me. And that does kind of upset me because Less than 5% of rapists will see a day in jail. It was an education that Emerson students Sarah Tedesco and Jillian Doherty didn't ask for. The heartache that follows campus rape. I feel like I'm a damaged person now. You know, I have a social anxiety about going outside now because I'm afraid that I'm going to see him. I'm not the same person anymore. Um, I never will be the same person. The attacks, traumatic enough, but the girls felt re-victimized, betrayed by their college. It must be incredibly difficult to go to your college and report you were raped. It was extremely scary going forward in the first place, but as the process continued, it got scarier and scarier. Several times with the school, um, I felt like I was in trouble. I completely thought that I was going to be suspended for accusing somebody else of doing this to me. Victim blaming is nothing new, says Dr. Gail Dines. For women, you, they're put into incredible danger and they define themselves as the problem because they drank. And often the school will blame them. Well, you drank. Basically, you broke school rules, so it's your responsibility anyway. Their lives turned upside down. Their alleged attackers, status quo. And it's just awful because, like, I see him. I saw him twice today. And I, you know, had classes today. I had to live my normal life. I was trying to get all these in classes, and with everything going on in the background, it was impossible for me. So I just completely had a mental breakdown. Joe Bergantino, executive director of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, led a three-month investigation into how campuses handle these cases. Eye-opening, to say the least. These cases were being judged by the same people deciding whether a student cheated on an exam or committed plagiarism. Colleges, not just Emerson, aren't equipped to deal with complicated sexual assaults, according to those who've studied the problem. Now, it takes special expertise to adjudicate a complicated case of sexual assault. Not the English teacher and the history professor sitting around a table asking the victim and the alleged assailant questions. So the, the whole process is absurd. And Bergantino's investigation found accountability is rare. The mindset is, this is a teaching moment. And you use this as a moment to talk about what you shouldn't do in life. Now, we don't, we don't treat crimes in, in the real world that way. You know, we don't bring criminals into a room and talk to them about how they shouldn't do it again. We send them to jail. You know, we punish them when they do something really serious. That doesn't really happen on college campuses. For Jillian and Sarah, the next lesson was Emerson's. First, they started a letter-writing campaign to the college administrators. Then Tedesco published her devastating account of rape and her struggles with a school policy for all to see in an online magazine. I just don't think that a lot of people realize the complete overtaking and life-changing things that rape does to you. I don't want anybody to have to feel this pain that I feel every day. You know, I want people to be able to get justice and I want people to be able to feel like it's a safe environment when they report their rape. I just want people to realize how traumatic rape is so that they know that, you know, this is a huge thing and also that they're not immune to it. 
They've also filed a complaint with the Department of Education, and they're not alone. Sexual assault victims across the country, including students at Amherst, Swarthmore, Vanderbilt, and the University of North Carolina, have claimed their cases were handled inappropriately. It was awful. Doherty says in her case, the judicial board used Skype to have her and her assailant question each other. The board believed that we were both honestly feeling like we were telling the truth, and that the fact that we were both intoxicated led them to think that maybe we just both weren't able to figure out what really happened that night. And um, that was it. It was sent to me in this really nice PDF, and I was just heartbroken. I didn't get a hearing like Jillian got a hearing. Tedesco says Although, she was told it would be best if she took time off and to keep the assault a private matter. The people who first handedly deal with survivors aren't completely trained correctly, um, so they don't know how to talk to somebody. Um, it just feels like you're being victim blamed. It feels like they make it feel like it was your fault that you were that you were raped. The school didn't help you. They made a point of saying, you know, go to the counseling center and everything. But the only thing about this, the counseling center at Emerson is that it's hard to get an appointment, and but it's like every other week. You know, as someone who is raped and is dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to be seen at least twice a week. Tedesco and Doherty believe the school violated their Title IX rights. This type of complaint is very important for the national movement. It's very important to get some laws on the books that say that this is what Emerson did wrong, this is what Emerson did right, these are all of the rights that the girls failed to have, and these are all of the privileges that Emerson gave to the accused. It's taken time, but Emerson is taking a hard look at its procedures, hiring a dedicated sexual assault prevention advocate. This is an opportunity to grow, to, to examine practices, and to move forward, putting in place anything that we think can help um, support students better. Dr. Sylvia Spears, Emerson's vice president of diversity and inclusion, wouldn't comment on Doherty and Tedesco's cases, but she's committed to making meaningful change. We think it takes an incredibly amount of courage uh, and commitment to share your story uh, publicly and to call the institution to do better. And so Emerson is committed to doing that. The good part about it is it shows schools that just because you're in the spotlight now doesn't mean you're the only one that's doing it wrong. But you are doing it wrong, so you need to get better. Just recently, Emerson held a second hearing in Jillian Doherty's case, and this time the Judicial Board found her attacker responsible for sexual assault. He was expelled. Campus rapists don't announce themselves. Most don't hide in dark alleys or dimly lit parking lots. They're not strangers. They can be the guy next door, the star athlete. <laughs> Most sexual assaults, I think, are committed by people who find a way to abuse their power and status and who are perceived by others as good people, top of the heap. Hard to believe that they could ever do that. But they do, often preying on the most vulnerable. 18-year-old, a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old will actually target victims based on whether or not their friends have left the party and they're alone, based on whether or not they might be crying in the corner. So basically um, pouncing on these vulnerabilities. Most campus rapists strike at the start of the school year. There are actual people targeting um, young, particularly freshmen, sophomore, girls. We still see this influx of cases at the beginning of a school year, and particularly Boston has a lot of colleges, and um, so it's an unfortunate situation. Do you hear much about girls getting taken advantage of on campus? I've definitely heard stories, you know, about it happening. Um, I, th I think a lot of the time alcohol is involved, and it also happens at really, you know, late hours and stuff. It's definitely part of the problem. Studies have found roughly 75% of campus rape victims were too drunk to consent. Alcohol can be used both as a means to become more aggressive, to become someone that you're not, to put your inhibitions down, as well as a tool to make someone more vulnerable to either not remembering or to being more susceptible to be raped or sexually assaulted. And because 90% of campus rapists get away with it, experts say they will likely strike again and again. It's very unusual to have someone who has victimized only one person. 
it doesn't make sense because you have to have a belief system that says that you have a right to have sex when you want it and that sex is about power for that person who's committing that sexual assault. If there is an accountability and there's not a cultural message that the behavior is unacceptable, it's our expectation that there are multiple victims. A group of concerned students at Boston College hopes to raise awareness. The problem is, is that I don't think people understand that how they be they're behaving is inappropriate. They think that this is just how things go, especially with the hookup culture on campus, that drinking and hooking up with someone is normal and okay, and consent really isn't an issue when it definitely should be at the forefront of their concern. Under Massachusetts law, sex without consent is rape. And in the eyes of that law, if you're intoxicated, you're unable to consent. For many students, that's crystal clear. There should never be a gray area of consent. You should never wonder, like, I wonder if she is consenting or if she isn't consenting. Like, consent is typically enthusiastic and obvious. And so when you're in that situation where you're wondering, like, oh, am I receiving this consent? You are not. I like to think that men are better than that and that we are capable of being drunk and being at a party and having a good time without, like, doing something that ruins someone's lives. I think if sexual assault is just boys being boys, that says something really bad about what we expect out of boys in our culture. Only about 5% of males will ever commit something like this, so it's more repeat offenders that are responsible for this. And the way that we can actually find who these, you know, perpetrators are is by having men who are not step forward and say, this is unacceptable, this is not an us versus you, this is a community against crime or against assault. The impact created by rape survivors sharing their very painful stories is spreading. It's sparking a movement on college campuses where young women and men are saying no more. If we found out that students were getting mugged at the same rates that they were getting sexually assaulted, we would be doing something about it. Newton's Ali Safran is taking action. When her sexual assault case was tossed out of court, she created something called Surviving in Numbers. I put up a sign at the spot where I was assaulted that said, this happens in your town and it's preventable and you can do something about it. Um, just kind of as a call to action and to say that this had happened. Action springing up at Syracuse University in another unique way, the Girl Code Movement. I hope that Girl Code can bring awareness to say, hey, this is an issue, this is a problem. It's about acting when students see someone vulnerable to prevent rapes from happening. Just recently, Jackie escorted a highly intoxicated girl back to her dorm room. I would have much, much rathered someone have doing that for me. Fewer rapes, fewer tears. That's the goal. It's something that I definitely want to voice my story to and tell them, being like, you know, there's a lot of us. We've always talked about that. You have a voice, use it. You've got a brain, use it. You've got a heart, use it. Never in my wildest dreams did I think it was going to be on this. She and Caroline, two of them are finding such amazing power. I'm kind of humbled by the two of them. Syracuse men have taken notice. It hit me pretty hard, like seeing someone who I knew so well, um, like have that happen to when it was something that I hadn't heard about much on campus at all. And in such staggering numbers, one in four college women. They always say there's no way that 25% of girls on campus are getting assaulted or attempted assaults, but the reality is, is those numbers are right. There are many of us who want to stand up and, and do something about this because I, I personally think uh, that it's one of the most morally despicable things uh, that someone could do. It's tough enough for the girls to be silent about it, but there's no reason for us to be silent about it. It's something we should stand up for as men. An outrage exposed by a couple of courageous girls who are standing up and saying enough silence, enough shame, enough blame. I think it really means a lot when you have girls that are passionate and they go up there and they say, you know, I want to stand against this because it happened to me. And I want people to, I want the world to know that it happened to me, but I want it to happen to anyone else. We just had this moment and this fuel and this fire where we felt like we had to do something. 